So we've been talking about why, why we are gathered here. We, we, if you remember the first week, we talked about encouragement. Because when you're sitting here during the week, you've got anxiety, depression, uh, you've got medical issues, you've got finance issues, uh, the car broke down, uh, the refrigerator went out, the washing machine's on its last leg, uh, the bathtub, you forgot that you were running the water and somebody called you and it was really important and next thing you know, everything's flooded and it just seems like anything and everything that could have happened, happened. And, and then never ever say this. I wonder what can happen next. Bad, bad question. You know, the Bible says that every, in everything, give praise to God. So, as you're sitting there cleaning up all of the water in the mop bucket, you just mop away and just start singing, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because guess what? It could be worse. It could be your whole house flooded. It could have been a downpour outside from the rain. Or it could be that you're out in Phoenix at 125 degrees, you, you know? So don't ask. Don't ask, could anything get any worse? But what do we do when we come to church? We're supposed to come to church to encourage, to get encouragement, but also to encourage others, okay? The second thing we talked about was rhythm, and that was a couple of weeks ago. And when we talk about rhythm, we're not talking about rhythm to the song or, you know, this has got a good beat, a slow beat or anything. We're talking about rhythm that you get into as a Christian. There are things that sometimes people say, well, I don't really like habits. There are some habits you really do need. As a matter of fact, if you will follow the life of Christ, you will find that Christ was a very habitual person. He got up in the morning, and the first thing that he did, he went out and he talked to the Father. He got alone wherever he was. He got up as soon as the sun was coming up, he would go out and he would talk to God. Don't know how long, doesn't matter. But he, but he did that. You also find that he was basically taught the Jewish faith, which said that I pray in the morning, I pray in the noontime, and I pray in the evening. So you'll probably find that Jesus probably had that pattern of praying at least three times a day. But I think you'll also find he was constantly talking to the Father. That's why the Bible says to pray without ceasing. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a formal prayer, but always talking to God. Hey, Watch over me. I'm taking a, a trip. Can you give me traveling mercy? And while you're there traveling, there, I don't know how many times that I haven't looked down at the gas gauge and then all of a sudden I look at the gas gauge and there's this little light. And I know that when that little light comes on, I got roughly about 50, gallon, 50 miles to go. But the problem is, I don't know exactly when that little light turned on because I was so engrossed in something else that it could have been on for 49 and a half miles. And so the next thing I'm doing is I'm praying real quick, Lord, get me to the next exit, the closest, closest filling station. I am not going to try to make it home. I'm not going to try to make it 50 miles. We're getting gas. Unless I'm watching it and it just came on, then, then that's okay. So, so that's one. Another is, is a devotional time, okay? Now, a lot of times what people want to consider devotion is a Bible reading. And, and sometimes what they do is people, and, and I'm not going to fault you for doing this. It's okay if you want to do this. Read the Bible through in a year. 
Because you can, you can get a calendar and it'll tell you, uh, you know, how do you want to do it? Read this many chapters in the Old Testament and this many chapters in the New Testament. And, and, it, and you've got a nice little calendar. You can mark it off and all these things. That's cool. If that's all you want to do is read. Okay? But that's not Bible study. If you want a Bible study, come on Wednesday night. We'll give you a Bible study. We have been in the book of John since January, the first chapter. Last week, we just finished chapter two. So that's through almost seven months it took us to get through two chapters. But I'll guarantee you something. Ask anybody that's been here on Wednesday night how much they've learned. And they'll tell you, like my wife made a, a comment about a verse we read this week. I have read that and read that and read that, but I have never seen that one word, I think it was, right? That God is, yeah, when, if you were looking in, in uh, we were in the very end of uh, chapter two, he, he was talking to his disciples and there were these others that, that were there and he, he said, you know, I, I, I don't know them. I, I didn't come into them because just because you call on, on Jesus doesn't mean that God's coming in. There's got to be this, this uh, uh, it's it's a, a a brokenness. Yeah. Can you grab that verse for me? Two twenty four, John chapter two verse twenty four, and then we'll get into the sermon. Yeah, I'm sorry. It, it wasn't. It, this wasn't in there. This is what happens when I when I stand up here and I don't look at my notes. Okay. Yeah. Because there's, remember in VBS, how they, that the preacher would always get up and he'd say, okay, if, if, you know, say this prayer after me. And then they would say, if, if, if this is the first time you've ever said that prayer, uh, then, then God's come into your life. And they'll tell you that saying this prayer, God comes into your life. That, that's not true. But look at what he says. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them, a, a lot of the people that were following him. Why? Since he knew them all. He knew their heart. God knows the heart of the person that's asking. And if that heart isn't right, he doesn't know you. There's got to be a brokenness that's in there. There's too many people that come to Jesus because they want to get out of the mess they're in. They want Jesus to fix the situation they got in, and as soon as the situation gets fixed, they want to go and do whatever they want to do. Be careful. So, we're talking this morning about strength, okay, and why we gather for strength. I want to start a little bit different. Back in 65 or 620 B.C., to 564 B.C., there was a slave in Egypt. And he was a black slave. And he would tell stories. Unfortunately, they didn't write a lot of them down until later on they wrote some of his stories. And they now have got books out the gentleman's name that they wrote everything by was a gentleman, and you, you'll hear it, the book is Aesop's Fables. His name was actually uh, Aacropolis, I believe was his original name. But he had a fable that I'd like to read for you this morning. And here it was. This one is called The Bundle of Sticks. 
It said a certain father had a family of sons who were forever quarreling among themselves. No words he could say did the least good. So he cast about in his mind for some very striking example that should make them see that discord would lead them to misfortune. So one day when the quarreling had been much more violent than usual and each of the sons was moping in a surly manner, he asked one of them to bring him a bundle of sticks. Then handling the bundle to each of his sons in turn, he told them to try to break it. But although each one tried his best, none was able to do so. So the father then untied the bundle and gave the sticks to his son to break one by one. This they did very easily. My sons, said the father, do you not see how certain it is that if you agree with each other and help each other, it will be impossible for your enemies to injure you. But if you are divided among yourselves, you will, know, you will be no stronger than a single stick in that bundle. And when you look at this, I'm sure you can see that you can apply this to probably a lot of situations that maybe that have been in your life. And maybe... You're asking yourself, well, how in the world does this pertain to church? What has this got to do with anything? So let's talk about it. Because we need to understand something. That we as a church are stronger together than we are when we are alone. Because the church gathers for strength. And sometimes you look at it, you're saying, okay, so what are you saying? So we're going to give you some scriptures this morning. Not from Aesop's fable, but from God's word that will help to explain what God is trying to say to all of us. There was a book that the most intelligent man, wisest man in the whole world. God asked him one day, Solomon, I'm going to grant you one thing. What would you like? Now, if you and I were to have a visit from God and he would say, I'm going to grant you one thing. What would you like? Some of you would probably say, well, I would, I would like a better job. Um, I'd like a place to live. I would like to be cured of whatever medical issues that I have. I would like to just stop growing old. I would love to be able to spend more time with my grandchildren or more time with my family. I would like this or I would like that. Or I would have loved to have been that person that hit the $1 billion Powerball, you know, and got 500 and some million dollars, Lord, to whatever. I, I mean, if you're going to ask for that, why don't you just ask him for, for you know, $7 trillion? Or 31 trillion, you know? I mean, why, why just stop it a little bit if he's going to give you all the money? But that isn't what Solomon asked for. Solomon asked for wisdom. And in, in Solomon's writings, God inspired a lot of wisdom. If you ever really want to read and do a Bible study. The book of Proverbs is pretty good. It has a lot in there. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number four. To 
together as a church, we have a greater harvest. Look at what he says. Where there are no oxen, the feeding trough is empty. But an abundant, abundant harvest comes through the strength of an ox. Now, some translations of it says, where there are no ox, oxen, it says the manger is clean. Okay? And so, you think, well, what, is, what does that have to do with it? Well, think about it. If you don't want to have a mess, you don't put anything in that, that stable. Because whenever you start putting animals together in a stable, there's going to be some messes. That's what animals do. They eat and, and they go to the potty. You know? And it's like us. But can you ever just imagine getting a bunch of oxen together? What, what do you get? It's going to be some pretty messy business, right? So you think about it for a minute. Being in a community sometimes is messy. Now, if you don't live out in the country with no neighbors for miles, that can be okay. But if you live in a, in a community where you have neighbors, sometimes your neighbors are not very good. Sometimes they play the music too loud. Sometimes they got kids that are disrespectful. And sometimes they just do whatever and nobody watches. Or you got your neighbor that loves to drive down the street and just empty their car out or throw their trash out, you, you know, and, and it just goes everywhere. So being in a community, a lot of times, it's messy. And sometimes it really gets the, these things. Now, sometimes in this community, you experience wounds. Somebody said something to you and, and they've hurt you. Or they said something to your kids and hurt your kids, which subsequently hurt you. Or they've done something maybe to your cars or to your property or whatever else. But the truth of the matter is when you get people together, and you start getting a lot of people together, it tends to sometimes get to be a big mess. And so when you think about it for a minute, sometimes this can be like church. Um, I'll just give you a story because most of you were not here when I got here, just Mark was. And let me, uh, no, uh, Peggy came, came, came later. But not much. So when I got here, uh, I got here in July of 2007. Uh, the church was uh, not very many people. They were basically elderly, uh, two kids, and those were um, Paul Griffin's uh, grandkids. They were here. Uh, they had baptized one person in five years, and that was Cecil Henry, who was uh, basically about 80 years old. And that was it. And I, I walk in here on uh, 4th of July. I, I was a bivocational. I was working in Columbus. I had the day off. And, and so that weekend, uh, they voted me in. So that Monday on the 4th of July weekend, it, it may have been the 5th or the 6th. I don't know when the 4th of July was. I'd have to look it up on a calendar. But I noticed something, and, and, and that was this. This is the baptistry. And the baptistry was covered. It had a, a ply, piece of plywood or something over it. 
And I hadn't really looked in it before, you know. I took over. And I took over, and I came in, and I dropped my computer and everything in there, and I took, started looking around, and I started really looking to see, and I took this off, and it was filled with Christmas trees. I went to the Sunday school rooms, and um, there wasn't any kids, so they didn't need the Sunday school rooms, and the Sunday school rooms was filled with Christmas decorations. This was the most beautiful church in Middletown at Christmas time. Things had gotten messy. They'd forgotten about what it was that God had wanted them to do. So we, we got together and said, what are we going to do? This was July. And I think it was, um, I had a friend who had some inflatables. So we decided we're going to throw a, a block party, I think. But we picked um, August to do it in, the next month. And it just happened to be the hottest day of the year every time we did this. So we did it. We asked about how many kids you think we're going to have. We'll probably have maybe 25, 30, whatever. We had somewhere close to 300 kids. I think it was that showed up. We were, I think we had everything, did we not, Mark? We had ice cream. Or, no, we had snow cones, cotton candy, popcorn. I mean, we had it. We had water going everywhere, the inflatables. We, <clears throat> we learned real quick how to roll up inflatables and how heavy those things were. And we started having a carnival every year and started reaching and reaching and reaching people. But it got messy because a lot of people don't like to do the work. And sometimes in church, that's what happens. It becomes a community, but it can get messy even in the church. Um, when we got flooded and, and uh, we, we, the pews were starting to fall apart and, and uh, some of the back pews were falling apart and you want to know why? We had a lot of lost people coming to church and they were holding on to the back of the pews and these things were, were not uh, the old wooden style glued together. These were the ones that were particle board, the newer type. And, and you can take and rip those things if you're not careful. And some of the back ones were starting to go into color. And, and uh, you know how many people didn't want to get chairs? You, you know? And then we, were, we had our kids program with Awana. And every Sunday, it was a chore because we had to take the chairs and stack all of the chairs up in the back so we could use this for the kids as a time of, of uh, play time, game time, how dare you? This is a sanctuary. Don't you know that you need to leave the chairs here? And sometimes it can get messy because we have different ideas and different, different things, failing to realize that why are we here? We're here to have a greater harvest. And we get a greater harvest when we come together. When we split apart, you don't see people saved anymore. You don't see people coming to the Lord anymore. You don't see people with repentance, with broken hearts. Because everybody's coming because of their agenda and, and what they want. I, I want this style of music, and I, I, I don't like this, and I don't like that. And... and <laughs> We've even had sometimes before, honestly, tell you how bad it's gotten, was I actually had to ask some people to not come back to church anymore and find another church because we had a lady who lived in a group home over here. She was the most faithful member of this church. Yes, she was, she was mentally challenged. And she would come in here 
And her name was Debbie Roberts, and she would sit in the back. And, and so she was sitting there one day. She had moved in, and this couple, older couple came in, and, and she, was, she, was, she was sitting next to them, and they were overheard saying, we're moving, we're leaving, we're not going to sit next to her. So when I heard that, I went to their, to their house, and I said, listen, you're not welcome here anymore. If that's the way you feel, just because she's not like you, you feel you're too good for that. And sometimes church, ladies and gentlemen, can be a mess. And people get hurt. Because why? We're not together. We're, we're more interested in our own agenda and our own preferences of how we do things. And so when you look at, look at these things, and, and the beauty of, of Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 4, it, it's, it talks about the oxen being messy, but there's a couple other things that it talks about. One is the oxen are strong. An oxen is not a weak individual or a weak animal. As Christians, ladies and gentlemen, so many times I hear people say, you don't understand, I'm not strong. You're not strong because you're allowing Satan to tell you you're weak. God said that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. My strength gets me nowhere. It gets me wore out, tired, beat down, mad, angry, and sad. But understanding that with him, I can be strong. Oxen are also stubborn. Ask my wife if I'm not stubborn. I'm very opinionated about certain things. One is the gospel. Two is Jesus. I will tell you, unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, there are two things that I know. One is I'm saved only by Jesus and nothing else. Not my church membership, not me being a pastor or anything else. I'm saved by him. And number two, I'm kept by him. I'm not kept by me. I'm kept by him. Which gives me the stubbornness. When somebody says, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, I'm stubborn to say, no, I don't. Because I know what he said. And I know what he continues to say. And so I continue to do that. Oxen are messy. Yes, there are sometimes I can be messy. There are sometimes I can get frustrated. Sometimes I can get mad. Sometimes I can do those things. And I have to walk away and, and say, okay, Lord, I need a bath. And, and it, some of you guys are saying, no, not you. No, yes, me. And let me say this. Let's be honest. So can you. There are sometimes you can be messy too. And sometimes we need to understand that, that oxen need a lot of care and direction through the harvest. And let me say this. As Christians, as a church, we need a lot of care and a, and a lot of direction through the harvest. So many times people want to, want to say, well, l let's do it the way this church does it, or let's do it the way that church does it, or I've read this book, or I, I've seen this program, and, and here's how they're doing it. That may be good for them, that may be great for them, but that may not be what God wants you, us to do. Maybe he's asking us to do certain other things and how, how to do these things. So what we need to understand is this, Jesus... Jesus has chosen us and to use us to build his church. Paul, or, or Peter calls it, living stones. I have never met a dead Christian. I have met backslidden individuals because every Christian has life in them because they have Jesus. Jesus. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as long as Jesus is still with you, you are alive. And may I say this to you? 
that when Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, from the moment I'm saved, Jesus is going to stay with me. Not only in this life, but in the next life too. So that's why I know that when, when people say, well, I can't wait to get to heaven to enjoy eternal life, let me say something to you. You're missing something. I'm enjoying eternal life right now. I'm not enjoying this life because this life gets messy. This body breaks down. It gets in pain. I get tired. I get frustrated and all those other things, you know, but I sure enjoy my, my walk with Jesus, okay? As long as I don't let Satan but get me down, then, then we're okay. So what do we need to understand? That even though the harvest is hard, and it is, I believe it's harder to reach people today than it's ever been. I really do. Why? I mean, I'll, I'll try to get through this today, okay? I might not, but I'm going to do my best. I was thinking this week, just a couple people came to mind. People that had an impact on my life. Uh, two ladies that uh, kind of took me as a young man and I was friends of their, of their sons and we all hung around together, but they became my Sunday school teachers. One was a lady by the name of Irma Hodge Another was a lady by the name of Irene Moore. Uh, both of them have already, I believe, have already died and gone on. Um, I think sometimes I may have been the one to help push them sometimes with, with some of the questions and stuff that I asked. But um, I just got to thinking. Y you know, it was awesome growing up as a child. I... I complained about having to go to church. I was a typical child. But you want to know something? I can look back on it now and say, I am glad that my mom and dad made me go to church. I, am, I may not have agreed with them at a lot of things, but that's one thing that I agreed upon. But what I find with parents today is church is not a, not a necessity. It's an option as long as there's nothing else. And then they run to you and they'll say, Pastor, my life has fallen apart. I have no idea why. And I say, do you want me to be honest with you or you want me to sugarcoat it? Well, sugarcoat it. Then you don't want to talk to me. Because why? When you don't gather together, you don't get strength. And we'll share this in a minute as to what I'm talking about. Because we're stronger when we start working together. And can I also say that there is a greater harvest when we start working together. Number two is where I'm at. Together we have a greater protection. First Peter, First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. Look at what he says. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, he's not your friend. He is your enemy. The devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone that he can devour. Let me ask you this question. What benefit is it to the devil if you're by yourself? Think about what advantage or what does he gain? If he takes and removes you from a fellowship and puts you out by yourself, you're out there. Or if you 
Luke leave this fellowship or you decide, and I hear this all the time, I'm okay by myself. I don't need anybody else. And I especially don't need church or church people. I hear this all the time. I don't need that. God makes the differ with you. He says, what is your adversary? What's he doing? Your adversary loves it when you get out by yourself. Because you know what he does? He's sitting there waiting. As soon as you get out there by yourself, he starts, you ever seen a, a cat? A cat hunts like a lion. Okay? Um, yes, I will. My illustration of a cat. Remember how that, now I, I don't have a tail to wag. Like the cat does to kind of mesmerize. But that cat just will sit there and just barely move. Just like it's an animation. And then they get down on their haunches. And when they get within striking distance, the claws are out, the teeth are out, and they're going to pounce on you. And that's Satan. He just kind of sits next to you and just, hey, hey, you're okay. You're okay by yourself. Don't worry about it. I got you. I got you. And then he just keeps whispering and whispering until what? You begin to trust him. And when he gains your trust, he wants to kill you. He can't kill your soul, but he can sure kill your testimony and take your joy and take your peace. You see, can I say something to you? Lions are lazy hunters. You think about it. I really don't want to have to get out there and chase something. I just want to kind of sneak up on them. I don't want to have to put out a lot of effort into it. That's Satan. He doesn't want to have to exert a whole bunch of effort to take you away. And what does, what does the lion do? Most of the time, the lion is looking for the young, the old, and the sick. And so what ends up happening is, as you're getting sick, you're getting weak. And a lot of Christians have become weak because they're not meeting. They're trying to get their strength from other things when we need to give our strength to each other. That's why today I asked you very specifically to not get by yourself to pray, but to get with two or three people. Why? Because God says where two or three are gathered together, or if any two or three will agree as touching any one thing and will ask it in my name, it shall be done. So whatever you are asking for, if the people that were there with you praying, God's listening and God's answering. And sometimes we forget these things. When, when 2 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, he says, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Look at what he said. He says, 
you be alert and of sober mind. He didn't say church be alert. He said you be. He didn't say small group. When you're in a small group together, you're in a church together, it is hard for him to attack us. He's attacking one by one. Now, he may attack from outside with certain other things, but we're talking about the individuals that make up the church. They can, they, he, he will attack the institution, okay, and do things of that sort. But we're talking about individuals as we collectively come together as the church. We're not talking denomination or church building. We're talking people in there. And so, here's the thing. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because I know thou art with me. Let me say this to you. You can go through the valley of the shadow of death by yourself, or you can go together with other people that want to walk with you through your journey of the valley of the shadow of death. And when you do, let me tell you something, you will find strength. You won't find yourself sitting around all the time thinking about how bad things are, how bad things are. You're thinking about, wow, guess what? I've got people praying with me. I've got people that are talking with me. I've got people that can reach God. We can together and I can feel what God's doing. When we begin to start talking about all of the other things that were there, and I don't know about you, how many of you would go to a bad part of town at midnight and walk through a dark alley by yourself? Not a bright thing to do. But if you know that there's a bad part of town and it's midnight, and you know this is a very high crime area, you're not going to walk through there by yourself. So why is it that we as Christians know that we're walking through a dark alley in this world and it's getting close to midnight? Why in the world do we choose to walk by ourselves? We're choosing to do it. And Take it to people that ain't here, okay? And tell them, come on, let's get strength together. And so we, it's like this. It, when we as Christians, we are one little stick, but when we take all of these sticks and put them together and we are bound by God, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, Satan isn't going to break it. He can't do it. As long as that, those sticks are held together by the power of God, he can't do it. And that's why I keep trying to tell people. So number three, together we have a greater strength. We talked about um, Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Go to uh, Ecclesiastes 4 uh, chapter 12. Or 4th chapter verse 12. I'm sorry. Look at what he says. And if someone or overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Other verses say that uh, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The more people you get together and the more this, this pile of sticks becomes, the harder it is for Satan to penetrate that. And so we gather these things. When you think about it, I don't find anywhere, and somebody correct me, I don't find anywhere that Jesus ever sent any of his disciples out by themselves. And later on, when Paul went on his missionary journey. He never went by himself. There was always someone else with him. When he had a, a disagreement uh, about taking John Mark one time, uh, him and uh, uh, Barnabas had an argument, and, and, and he said, okay, well, I'll take him. 
And so Paul ended up taking Silas. And, and then, so John Mark and, 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 um, and uh, Barnabas went. And, and, and they did a missionary journey to complete this thing. So we need to understand something, that there are so many someones out there that are overpowered. But when we take and put all those someones together in this bundle, they can't be overpowered because God is there. Paul said, um, when you think about it, in Romans chapter 16, go back and read it, when he starts talking about all of the people that were working together for the sake of the gospel. So let's conclude with this. I skipped over this, and I want to go back into, into Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And look at what he says. Um, it, okay, um, uh, it, it's not Ephesians, it's Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry. Verses 9 and 10, look at what he says. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Remember the A-team? And you remember Mr. T? His famous comment was, I pity the fool. What he said was absolutely scriptural. Everybody would laugh at him, but he was saying, I pity the fool. God says in Ecclesiastes, I pity the fool who walks by himself. God's calling it foolish. That's his words. I hear people all the time say, you shouldn't call anybody a fool. God does. And guess what? That gives me the right to call him a fool too. I'm not trying to be derogatory. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just saying this is what God says. God says to pity the fool that wants to walk by himself. That's the most foolish thing that you can ever do as a Christian. It's to separate yourself from everybody else. And that's exactly what God says, okay? So think about it for a minute. There's been people here, and, and you may be here today when you've been down, when you're hurting. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've got difficulty paying your bills. It seems like everything is just piling up and piling up and piling up. And you're trying your best to make it. I've been talking to a lot of people that's in this situation where they lost a loved one recently, a husband a child, a companion. And they say, I'm all by myself. I don't know what to do. Some say, I, I don't feel like living anymore. I don't feel like I got anything to live for. First thing I ask them, It's where's your support system? Well, I've made bad choices and my family has disowned me. I said, do you go to church anywhere? No, I quit going a long time ago. And I tell them, we've got to get you a support group. We've got to get you some support here. Because by yourself, you're going to keep going down further 
and further and further. You need some support. If it's financial, it's, it's okay to understand sometimes that you're not, you can't handle money, that you need help. Okay? I came from a family that you don't save money, that you live from paycheck to paycheck. And when paycheck came, we had everything, and we'd, we would buy food, you know, groceries for the week, and then whatever was left, cool. And if, huh? If, yeah, just go spend it or do whatever until I met my wife. And my wife grew up in a family where her dad learned to save. I don't have to worry about if a major bill comes up, I, you know, God's blessed to be able to financially be able to do that. But I haven't always been that way. And if it wasn't for her, I would not be that way because she's taught me these things that I had to unlearn. And sometimes there are people within the church here, they're, they're not going to make fun of you. They're not going to criticize you. They're not going to say you're stupid. You should know better. They're going to help give you wisdom and help walk through this because that's what we're here for. It's sometimes, may I say to you this, it's more than just giving you spiritual help because sometimes the external stuff that you get into will affect your spiritual growth. And when he brings us here, he brings us here because we each, we each bring something different to the table. We all don't bring the same thing. And that's why I try to tell people, church isn't a cure-all. It doesn't cure all of your issues and all of your problems. But man alive, it's the best you got. My wife was just showing me a news clip thing that, that she just had, and they've been talking about this, that some banks are already closing people's accounts, and they don't even know about it. They're not letting them withdraw money. It's crazy, people. What's happening? It really is, because people are putting their trust in a lot of other things. Instead of the one thing that we really need to put our trust in, and that's Jesus. And the church is here to help, not here to throw you away and not make fun of you and do all of these other things. And so may I say to you, and that is this, that asking for help, you, know, you guys want to get an invitation. Asking for help doesn't make you weak. Can I say that to you? Asking for help does not make you weak. Strong people ask for help. Weak people try to do everything by themselves. And God is saying, no. You want to be strong? Have somebody with you. Why? Because it's harder to break get two people hey now we're really getting strong you can't do it by yourself why do we gather we gather to get strength we gather to get stronger if you know somebody that hasn't been in church for two three months Call them up and ask them, how's things going? And then when they tell you that everything's fine, say, quit lying to me. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. I'm not here to criticize you for not being here. I'm just trying to tell you I'm here to help. I'm here to help. How do I know and why do I know that? Because let me share this with you. I got out of church for about four years was the most miserable person in my life was that four years 
you would have never known who I was. And you would have never liked me because I was not a nice person. But you know what? I found out I needed something. I needed to return to God, but I needed to return to people. Oh, I had friends that I worked with and all that stuff. But it's not the same. This is where I get my strength. It's from you guys. From each and every one of you. And when you're not here, I miss it. I miss when there's 70, 80, 90 people in here singing to the top of their voice. And this church is just rocking. Or when we're singing a soft song and you can just feel the hearts and the Spirit of God just pouring out. It is just an awesome experience. That helps get me through Monday, Tuesday till I come back on Wednesday and then I, get, I need some more to help me get through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to come back to Sunday. I need that time. That's why I do small groups during the week. Because I need that. I need that strength. My question to you this morning is, how much strength do you have? Are you hurting? Quit trying to do it by yourself. You're here. But join together. Maybe God's bringing you to this congregation, bringing you into this family. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ, you come by baptism through salvation first. By baptism. Maybe you're here, you've been baptized, you've been a part of another church. You come by letter, you come by statement, you come. And you come to join this family. And now you've got a big family that you become a part of to gather strength from. Let's stand as they sing.